How many people were in the, uh, my talk earlier in the week? Okay. So some of this is going to cross back over some of the introduction stuff. I apologize. Um, I, I might want to ask you guys, who's Ray? And uh, you guys can help fill, fill in some of the gaps for people. So um, my background is that um, I come from an engineering background. Uh, originally, when I uh, left school, I was an electrical engineer. I joined a very small company by the name of Intel Corporation, um, very small organization at its time. Believe it or not, it was only 32,000 employees when I joined. And then over the next decade, it grew to 120,000 employees in that period of time. But the overall, just the way that I approach problem solving, you know, that is my problem solving technique. Um, it is literally, let's, let's stay up, let's have coffee, let's throw a problem in there, and then eventually a solution comes out the other end. And the artifact of that, and if you guys who are engineers in the room, yes, and what, what are your roles? I'm just curious. What, what do you do if you're not an engineer? What, are, you a, are you a designer or are you a, uh, what's your role? More of a product owner. Product owner? Uh, what another product owner over there? He's yeah. like, yeah, product owner. That's, yeah, that's who I am. A any other job roles? A coach. A coach? Not practicing as usual, but I'm, I'm a coach as well. Yeah. So, so you know, probably similar types of uh, the technical and even you know, I believe everything's a technical discipline. I don't believe in this whole non-technical technical stuff. Everything we do has some technical components associated to it, and. Of course, the artifacts itself come out as being, for me, it's sarcasm. Um, Intel was a very complex environment. And we actually dealt with not just one level of complexity at the engineering level. Our projects were, if you look here, those were all the teams that uh, a single microprocessor that's being developed for a laptop, those were all of the different components and pieces that needed to come together in order for us to produce some form of product out the back end. Uh, believe it or not, Intel does more software and more hardware than you would think. We actually do what is known as first artifact, which is a functional laptop that is any OEM can take and then take that design and just put their name on it if they wanted to. Most don't, they make some changes around it, but if you open one motherboard at Dell and you opened up another one with HP, you'd find those motherboards look pretty darn similar. The other thing is, is we provided most of the software stack. And we wrote portions of, of driver software for Microsoft. We wrote, rewrote the iOS uh, for Apple, a part of Team Apple. I was a part of that at one time. Um, Steve Jobs is everything that you have ever read about him. He's, he's a difficult person to work with. But so we, we, we're dealing with social complexity, 162 uh, uh, teams worldwide, strategic complexity, engineering complexity. We had all of that. And of course, it wasn't exactly the most comfortable environment to work because as most big companies, uh, we had competing concerns across multiple teams. And to get something done and to, to get an innovation out was very difficult. I'm a part of the Agile Alliance. If you want to know more about that, you can go stop by the booth and I can fill you in on that. I've given that speech 136 times so far, so I'm getting pretty darn good at it. The last one, uh, for those of you um, who, who heard this earlier in the week, um, I did have a, a stroke. Um, it was about three years ago. Um, I uh, had a blood clot that went to my brain and I could not move my entire right side of my body. So my voice, to me, is different now. And sometimes that's a little bit distracting. And sometimes a little stutter comes out. And I apologize for that. The real reason why I'm actually saying it, though, is that this shot that was going into my arm at the time, um, the doctor said that this can only be used 4% of the time. And I took that as it's only 4% effective. And, you know, because after that shot was given to me, I actually recovered most of my functionality on my right side. But he's saying 
what, what, he says, no, the, actually the drug is 99% effective. It's just that if you give it after four hours after the stroke starts, then it actually is not effective at all. So my advice to you and my public service to you is be fast. If you see any of these signs at all, it's 112 here in this country, uh, call, get yourself to the doctor right away, um, however you do it, because it, it'll save your life. Uh, yes? I was just taking oh, I'm sorry. These slides will come to you guys, as a matter of fact, too. Um, so innovation. Innovation over a, a period of time, I, I, I'm fascinated with changes that have occurred in, uh, in our world. Back in uh, the 1800s, you used to have to work for six hours in order to get one hour's worth of reading light. So you would have to labor that long to either acquire a candle or build one. So it was actually quite astonishing now that we get into 2010, just for a fraction of a second of work, you earn enough money to get one hour of light. And I, thinking about that evolution over time, you know, these are some big quantum gaps in my, in my mind about how we've been accelerating towards things. Humans have been for a long time engineers. We, we would take physical substances and build things. In the Stone Age, that's probably one of the most primitive innovations that are around, a stone tool, stone axe. And surprisingly enough, it's about the same size as a computer mouse. Um, do you, is anyone in this room an expert enough that you could build an, a computer mouse? Or is that a nodding yes? <laughs> could, well, could be either one. Well, I mean, could, do you know how to mine, you know, drill for oil for the plastic? Do you, do you know how to um, build a capacitor? I'm talking build it similar to the Stone Age. From, from, scratch. from scratch. I mean, if you look at the bill of materials to build a mouse, there, are, there were more than 150 items that were on there of different components and pieces and sub-assemblies and other things. And if you think about the countless number of biochemists, engineers, oil workers, everything that has to come together for, for that innovation to actually exist and to be so at scale, you know, everyone here has a mouse, right? You all own one. It had to cross through hundreds and hundreds of people. And yes, of course, you also needed this guy to deliver coffee as well in order for it to, you know, these people to be fed. There's, a, there's millions of people that are behind actually making this innovation come into existence. This one, of course, was just required a rock and a crafty human in order to go produce. I had someone that, at a previous presentation I gave this at said, no, it was two rocks. You needed one rock to hit the other rock. Okay, true, but still the bill of materials was a lot simpler. Innovation over the years, I don't think has changed that much. I, I think that if you look at the caveman problem versus what we have in the computer age, um, it, these things are not too terribly different. The only thing that we're hitting now, and I'm not sure if you've ever experienced this, uh, similar to what happened at Kodak. Kodak is a, it used to be a film developing company, right? Did you know that they developed the first digital camera? And this gentleman here who actually invented the camera was told by his boss to hide it because the innovation dilemma there was if we actually released it as Kodak, we would undermine the rest of our business. And the business case itself, he wasn't equipped enough to be able to, to look at and say, what are the economic impacts as an engineer? He was only looking at, technologically, was it feasible to do? And he was unable to convince the management to be able to do that. And if he, if he would have been able to convince management 
Kodak might be still in the same business today, still with photography. Today, actually, Kodak is a chemical company. They're doing it quite successfully now, but they're not doing film developing any longer. The other one, as I talked earlier in the week, the level of complexity that we're dealing with because of the simplicity of the interfaces is impacting us greatly. You know, the mouse has three buttons, but think of the complexity that's behind those three buttons and how they actually interact with the rest of the system. As systems designers or as systems people, you know that as that continues to grow, uh, as we push it down to maybe a single interface, it can, that contraction of being able to get things done becomes even more and more difficult itself. So the dilemma at Intel, and I, I will use the Intel word, um, any Intel lawyers? None? Okay, we can talk about them. Um, could you delete when I say Intel off of the film, please? But at Intel, we got into a dilemma because we, we started adopting Agile back in about 2003. Uh, we had roughly around, by the time I left, 2,700 Scrum teams, countless other and other Kanban teams. We had Scrum of Scrums, we had portfolio systems and everything else, but we were still producing just a lot of stuff. And if I had to answer the question, were we producing value? we didn't have a good answer for that. And as you know, this is anchored in value. It's delivery of value, continuous stream of value to our customers. And what we found was is that people were using this word wrong. If I had to just do a quick poll in this room, you probably all would have a different view of what value is. And that dilemma for our innovation work and, and our early innovation uh, stuff that we were doing really had a huge impact on the discussions that we were having and the impact that we were having across the groups. I happened to buy that book, uh, Don Reinardson's Flow Book, and I turned to a particular page and that changed my life. And what he had did, and I, I'm using this with his permission because I called him right up afterwards and said thank you, you know, it, it, you ever find that when you find a method, you've been trying to think about what to call it, and then suddenly it's somebody named it, and you just have to go reach out to them and say, thank you for kind of pulling my thoughts together? This one is the, the artifact that really did. And what he had did was, is he put product value off on its own box. And at Intel, we were conflating cycle time, product cost, development expense, and value all into one thing. And a majority of the discussions that we were having, we couldn't detach one from the other. And reality is, they're interconnected, but they're all uniquely by themselves different and different measurables, rather than just one thing. But you know, if, if you have a high value product going out, Yes, these other ones affect it, meaning if suddenly we're too late to the market and we miss the market window, product value goes down. You know, we had things like holiday refresh and other different uh, uh, events that we'd have to go through the year. And if we miss that window, we literally would have to wait an entire year afterwards. Talk about making management grumpy, right? If you miss the window. So they do affect one another. So once we got an understanding of this, we started drawing some Pareto diagrams together. By the way, this is an example of a, uh, of a Venn diagram that is the worst one I've ever seen. This was actually at an airport. Our values barely, trust, barely uh, intercept trust, partnership, and innovation. And I was wondering what this little, little sliver actually is there. But we started going with Venn diagrams and we came up with this. And this, this was a, a probably a, about a month to two month venture of our getting together with the groups from the, the business, the technology, and the users. And we started to think about the interface of those three things and how they collapse together to form a solution. 
Now, a solution in my book is just not the product that you're shipping. It's also all of the services that are around it. It's about the user experience. It's about the full deal from purchase to falling in love with it. And we want people to fall in love with our products. And so we were thinking about these relationships between the business and the technology group, this kind of light blue area up here. And what we had figured out was that was the majority of our conversations that we were having internally. And that actually isn't value. That's actually supply chain questions. I'm, I need a bag of parts by a certain date. That's DevOps. There's DevOps stuff in that, that light blue area that's in there. And so we started building this taxonomy out. And by the way, complete solutions are important. Why? Because if you don't think of the full system and its implementation and where it goes, you end up with these types of issues right here, which is, you know, that's a poor implementation. You know? We don't want to be shipping products like this. This is not how our products should look like in the marketplace, you know? So the model expanded as we started the conversations deeper, and we determined that the economics is where, what's around business. And the economics are the marketability, the profitability, and the affordability of the system. The other corner, the implementation of the technology, the land of the engineers, is about manufacturability, functionality, and consumability. And then this mystery thing for us, the user, the usage of it, is actually circled around desirability, usability, and usefulness. It's a conceptual thing. And the problem with conceptual things, as you know, and this is where we start to get into the fuzzy thing of, if I ship a particular product to one group of people, they love it, and another group of people might not love it. But this visual framework itself started to give us a, a, a better understanding of our own product life cycle and how we go approach things. So we did a quick assessment. We said, okay, now that we believe the model, let's write down all of the methods that we have internally at the company. And this is a watered down version of it for Intel Legal because they didn't want to see a all of our processes on the wall. But this literally was a huge thing on the wall when we were doing it, and we were putting up every single method that we had. And if you notice, heavy on technology. That did not surprise me at all. We're, we're Intel Corporation, we should be heavy in technology in those areas. What we found was we were lighter than expected in the business area. The business was not feeding our Agile teams effectively. They weren't providing dollars and resources and investments the way that we did. And then, if you notice the usage, even less. That one post-it that went up about value management, we debated it for three hours to the point where someone said it was on there, someone said it wasn't. We kept fighting whether or not it was or it wasn't. Until the end, I just put up my hand and go, look, we've been talking about it enough that it probably doesn't exist because none of us can be in a consensus with that. You're going to get these slides. This is the full-blown model. I know it's an eye chart for you guys. You guys can go look out offline. We went to the next level of detail down, and specifically the one in question is this business versus usage area. That's value. As a company, you extend a promise. And that promise, if it's realized by your customer, your customer will come back to you and say, hey, that was great. Value, re value received, value is there. And if you continuously deliver value to your market, then you actually build brand. To the point where when my family goes to an Apple store, we do an experiment. I'm a fan, I have four kids and my wife and myself, we will, stay, we will make a queue at an Apple store. We'll just stand in a line and notoriously within 15 minutes, somebody will come join our queue. 
and they don't know why we're in line, and they, but they know that there might be something good on the other side. And eventually, you know, I turn to the person, and I go, um, can I help you? And they'll say, well, what are we waiting for? And it's nothing, it's just my family standing here. You know, <laughs> it's a game we play. What came out of this uh, exercise in our company is we started having to go explore methods. We didn't have methods that actually were in that value bubble box. And so the things that we discovered as, as we went through, and we'll talk about a few of them. If you get a chance to listen to my talk on Kinevin, that was recorded with Dealing with Unknowns. You guys can go listen to that. The ones that I'm going to focus in today is we've talked about the three circle model, but I'm going to talk about solutions life cycle because that one itself changed the dynamics of fixing the Kodak problem within our company. So most life cycles that we have today look like this. Even in Agile, we still have this, we explore, we develop, we deploy, we support. Overarching. These are all activities. And the problem with if you do activities, what do you think happens to your organization? Does anyone have a guess? Everyone's busy. And exploration, sort of. Has anyone heard of Conway's Law at all? Conway's law says that if you establish a process or an architecture, or in the case of, say, if you take your system's architecture for your, whatever product you're working on, and if you were to squint your eyes and look at it, you could probably see the org chart that developed it. The modules, the sections, and everything else. Conway's law says that you're going to make these divisions, managers report into you know, unit A, unit B, unit C. And it's going to look like that on the org chart. Our org chart was explore was Intel Labs. And that's all they did was explore, plus also our sales and marketing group. They didn't talk to the people in support. That was its own group as well. Develop, same thing. We had groups that did development. And everything was a handoff, inefficient handoff at that. And so our agile adoption at, before we got to this point this develop and deploy area and legitimately just develop, that was where our Agile stopped. It didn't stretch forward, it didn't stretch back. We were stuck with Conway's Law at that point. What we redefined it as is we started to think about what is our innovation pipeline within our company. And we decided to go to more of an outcome-based life cycle. And the outcomes that we came to the conclusion of that we wanted was opportunity, concept, candidate, solution, obsolescence. What do you think resonates with you when you see that? I'm curious. Obsolescence. Obsolescence? We, we did not know how to do that as a company. What, what's your view on that? Well, I'm fascinated that you're building obsolescence into the Right. Well, we didn't plan for it before, which means we would have people seven years doing the same thing. And you would ask them, why are you building it? And they go, I don't know. What, what, what do you, what do you, uh, we load it up to the website. And what, does anyone use it? I don't know. We, we, we were in a really tough spot in that case. The thing about these words and the reason why we picked them is, is that Let's say if we're framing an opportunity. An opportunity, could, when we think about who do we need to frame an opportunity, we suddenly have a much wider aspect of who do we need. Well, we do need the guys in the labs, and we also need um, the sales and marketing people, but maybe we also need someone from downstream engineering to be here. We need someone from test. We need somebody from uh, deployment. We need people, we need HR, because maybe we don't have the skills to do that particular, um, that particular um, uh, opportunity. And what we were surprised with is we could actually measure the value 
of an opportunity versus another opportunity. Because of the way we framed it, we ended up now being able to ordinarily sort the highest priority opportunity to the lowest level of opportunity. Opportunity then flew, goes over to the next stage, which is if it's picked off the top, we go into this concept phase. And in the concept phase, we would create multiple concept examples of what that, how to satisfy that opportunity. Not one, which we used to do was just one. We now did five different concepts. And then we can measure those because we would hand them to a customer and say, what do you think? Do you, and these are paper prototypes and some functional prototypes and others, but it was enough to be able to measure its value. The next thing, candidate, is the one we're now going to take to scale. This is the one we've decided that this is where we're going to have to do the tooling, we're going to have to go build fabs, we're going to have to go do all of this stuff in order to prepare to sell it in the millions. And that's a whole bunch of different set of activities that are needed there. That's when we started to also think about the operational envelopes that these things sit in, um, uh, you know, w whether or not we have to care about security and all the other bigger activities that were around it, and then eventually to a solution and then to that obsolescence. And obsolescence for us was, you know, how long should we support it for? And when should we kill it? Sorry, yeah. Sure. sure. I, I, yes, and I do not have a flip chart here to demonstrate this. What we would find in the opportunity phase is we might have a couple, the, think of those three circles that I drew earlier, and this, these were actually drawn on our opportunity map. We would maybe have a tight coupling between the business and the technology, and then we would draw the bubble of user down over here because we were unsure whether or not the capabilities we were providing and whether or not the brand offering was something that they want. So we had actually a visual that showed that relationship. Or it might be the technology and the users were there, but the business was out of alignment as well. So exiting opportunity, it might not mean we have a balanced solution yet. But we could, though, think about one versus another. You know, it, you know, and, and we found that the discussions became a lot easier because we actually were dealing with a whole organizational brain view versus just what the labs team thought or the sales and marketing team thought. I'm not going to read all of the definitions. There was a criteria that was established for the exiting of each of these, of these milestones. Um, you know, you know, I'll read the opportunity. The idea, event, or situation is favorable characteristics in the business usage and the technology in order for it to be on that list. So we had a criteria. If it did not meet those, it's not on the list. You got to go prove that. You got to go bring those together. We did things like opportunity canvases, you know, the, the work that Jeff Patton and stuff uh, has been leading. Um, we, we're now having deeper conversations about user value, user metrics, solutions today, budgets, other things. We're all coming in to these things that we're helping to make a deeper evaluation early on to be able to give us that value analysis. And the life cycle itself, and I'll build this out, we also then changed how we did our product life cycle that we would not paint everything with Scrum. Scrum is really good in this middle candidate phase when, when we have real high degrees of certainty with the product. We have a good, well-defined set of user stories. It works horribly over here in the opportunity phase. We're actually having to do more experimentation, state to fail type of work in order for this to succeed. The last component of this, then, after we went through all of this, we discovered that our work environment was wrong. And our work environment looked like a, tell me what seems more innovative to you. Is it A or B? 
be more, more of an open space. Now, if you're living in an open space hell today, I apologize for that because people misinterpreted that it's not about having just one space. You should have multiple spaces. And so the space I'm about to show you, this innovation hub, these were open spaces because they were trying, they were engineered to create some, some different things happening in the brains of the people who were in there. We absolutely still had places where people could go and just be by themselves that they needed to be. So I, I do not believe in one size fits all. So innovation hubs themselves, they come with a set of tenants. They come with a set of values that we're trying to go expo expand in during these. Number one, we wanted them to be, to enable the inventor and the entrepreneur to be able to innovate. It needed to be a space like that. The secondary thing with it is it needed to have an environment and a culture where serendipity can occur. Where, because ideas, as you know, serendipity, it, it, it's, most innovation is accidental. I, some, I do my best work by trying to explain a problem to somebody and just maybe just the act of telling somebody actually, I go, oh, now I know. The next one, it's a safe, a safe to learn place, a learn safe place. That was my verbiage of, I don't like the word fail at all. So I always like it's learning. We needed to be able to harvest knowledge out of there. And the last one, this evolved after we built them. And we thought, well, we should carry this forward because I'll talk about some of the work we did in this space that actually was pretty cool, um, which is be an outpost for a higher cause. Um, give you an example of this. John Deere Tractor used to have a product vision. They build tractors, right? And their product vision pretty much said, build the best tractor. And their sales were, you know, steady. They changed their product vision to feed the world. And just the simple act of changing their, pro their, their overall arching corporate vision to feeding the world, innovation went up, sales went up, everything basically was people were thinking out of the box more. So being the higher cause becomes important. I've already talked about serendipity, pleasant surprises, happenstance occurs. I do believe that you should never have, do you, ever, do you guys get in an elevator and you got one of your coworkers there and you're doing everything you can not to make eye contact with the person? It's like, ah, I don't wanna to talk to this person. I just wanna get to the coffee. You know, whatever it might be, you know? We found that if, if we made open staircases, people would then bump into each other and go, hey, Ray, how's it going? What are you working on? Try this as an experiment. If you ride an elevator up to you know, your, wherever your office is and if there's a coworker there, just turn to them and just ask them about their day, whatever it might be. And get, granted, I know that when you ask that, you might hear the, not the, the thing you wanna hear. Because in America, when someone says, how is your day, they're not really asking how your day is. You know, because I've, I've done that social experiment where I go, how's your day? And I'll go, horrible, my dog died. And they went, oh, okay, <laughs> see us, you know, make them a little awkward with it. Here's a picture of one of the spaces. This is one of the innovation hubs that we had in Oregon. Um, Couple things to notice, we got 3D printers on the back wall, vinyl cutters, there's an embroidery machine in this picture, there's a uh, pretty close to a $25,000 color 3D printer. On the opposite wall, there's laser cutters, a plasma cutter, and a couple of other different things to go make rapid prototypes quickly. And this group of people uh, came in and pitched an idea and they're currently working with a coach that we provided in order for them to be able to take advantage of all that cool stuff. Because not everyone knows how to 3D print. Not everyone knows how to use a CAD drawing package. Well, we pair with them and we teach them how to go do that. 
We had vending machines where if you needed an Arduino or a, a, um, any form of prototyping things that itself, you could go up with your badge and you can just get it. So you didn't have to go order any of the stuff to go build a prototype. We had it available for you just to go and swipe of your badge itself. That's cool, right? I think that's really cool. The, the printers itself, um, this is another view of it. This is a, a, a PC board milling machine. So if we needed to go create a PC board and create a functional prototype, um, we had that available as well. We could literally turn something from a prototype on a CAD package to some form of prototype that you can add to somebody within a couple of days. Granted, that is not the super clean final production version, but it's good enough to go hand to a customer and say, is this something that you would want? Here's an example that Oculus did. Anyone have an Oculus Rift? If you ever get a chance to go to Oculus, the 3D, the, the company, that is the earliest prototype right there. It's kind of embarrassing, but th that's, then it iterated like 20, 30 different versions after that. So we never had the, that embarrassment there. The innovation hubs actually encourage something called, ex I'm going to, my stutter came out there, um, acceptation which in biology, as you know, that's where we might have created something for one thing, but then it was used for something else. All of the prototypes in the hub had a place where people can go look at them. So something six months ago, something longer, we could go off and look at it just in case, hey, what about that component right there? Maybe I can use it for something else. That was available. Within the space itself, this is what the activities look like. These are people brainstorming together about product ideas. You know, here is a, uh, this person over here is in Argentina and came and visited a design session that we had um, um, within Oregon at the time. Here's another uh, stand up with three of the robots where there's most of the people were remote, but also still contributing in the hub itself. And by the way, that's what Agile value? We value what over what? Interactions, face-to-face -face communication. They're all face-to-face. -face. And they can drive anywhere on campus on those, those robots that we had. The higher cause one, and I know I might be going a little over, um, but is uh, we started when the printers were idle we were printing prosthetic hands for children who had lost a hand. And so if we weren't using them during the daytime for, for whatever purpose, maybe they were idle, we started just churning these out. And then we got with local school kids to come into the facility and to assemble them. And um, this particular one right here, the, the red and white one there, the request from the kid was that they wanted something that looked um, look like Iron Man. So we were also customizing the designs as well so that you know when the kid, and we had, I don't have the pictures of the kids because I didn't have permission from their parents to show them, but you know seeing the picture of the kid though with their Iron Man looking prosthetic hand was pretty darn cool. And it also helped to give us experience with the tools that were there. In conclusion, what, 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 what it looked like though from a from a supporting and services. The two activities were that in the very beginning, we did a lot of sense making and problem solving. And then along the way, there were people involved to be able to help people get to scale. The most innovative thing, and this is my most proud accomplishment that I did at Intel, is that before, when I was doing things, even if I was in the shower and I came up with a great idea, that was owned by Intel because I signed an agreement as an engineer that everything that I thought about became Intel property. In our model, if you create a prototype and you pitch it to our executives, because we would pitch it in a Shark Tank environment and ask people, 
the, the, the Intel um, people, uh, the, the executives, would you fund it as a project? And if they said no, we would sign all, all the IP over to the inventors and we would connect them with venture capital companies in order to say, if Intel doesn't want it, maybe we need to launch a new company that's going to do it. And we launched several companies based upon work in an innovation hub. Ideas, and the reason why I'm sharing all this with you today, ideas are, are like, um, gosh, they're, they're like a, a virus. They can consume you. I want you to take the ideas that I gave you today and I want, I want it to live in your brain for free and I want it to basically take over what you think about during the day. I want that infection. I want to get you infected with the innovation hubs and all the other things that I'm bringing up today. I want you to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, oh, damn, Ray, he gave me this you know, innovation hub idea, and now i got to go build one. If you do build one, or if you do any of these ideas, I would like feedback. Not that, not that I wanted any royalties or anything like that. It would just make me proud that these ideas expand and go further. Visit me on the Agile Coaching Network. It's a podcast. Everyone's got a podcast. I know that. So it's not sexy anymore to have one. But um, you guys are welcome to join. I have a number of people from India that actually join up this call. It happens monthly. I think the next one's actually next week. Um, it becomes a podcast. If you can't call in, iTunes, TuneIn, Spotify, all those syndicates. And if you need to reach me, um, there's two addresses. Um, I do work half time with the Agile Alliance, so you can reach me through my Agile Alliance email, or you can reach me through my other vanity, which is uh, the uh, New Agility, and you can um, reach me through there, and I'd love the conversations. Do we have time for any questions? Okay. You in the back. Yeah. Yes, we we would we would look whether or not the VIN was. We we would like to see that they're all balanced, that they all intercept. All the ideas and opportunities had those alignments drawn on the chart. So. The canvas, we actually had the al an alignment diagram that people would just sketch out on there. Yeah. That way you could actually, as a Kanban, by the way, Kanban is a visual signal. I can easily just go look what might need attention. So, other question? Well, you guys know where to find me. I'm indentured at the Agile Alliance booth, and I'm stuck there for the next couple days. So you can find me there if you guys want to have a further conversation on it. Thank you, guys.